Hello, Nasson. Hello, and welcome everyone to the evening. Hon uh, dir ail sgwrs ar gyfer ein uh, arddangosfa gwyl y ferch, sydd gynna ni yn car yn tan yr ugeinfed o fawr. Um, welcome all, thank you all for joining us. Uh, this is our second talk for our exhibition for gwyl y ferch that we've got in Cannes until the 20th of this month. And I'm very, very happy to welcome you all and to welcome especially our speakers. Um, so, Dwi'n Falchawn o Gallu Cyflwyno Ein Siaradwyr, Hena Mam y Gynnyn ni, Mary Rose Pritchard, Sarah Holyfield a Rachel Harris. So, tonight we've got Mary Rose Pritchard, Sarah Ho... I keep on messing... I keep on messing somebody's name every time, sorry. That bit will be edited out. <laughs> Sarah Holyfield and Rachel Harris. Uh, Gwrs gwrs, mae gynnyn ni hefyd un o drefnwyr y rwyl, sef Fionn Pritchard, and we've also got Fionn Pritchard, one of the two organisers of the festival and the exhibition. So, just i ddweud yn sydyn, yn arni fel cydlynu carn a fel person sy'n arwain ar carn, da ni'n falch iawn o gefnogi gwyl y ferch, um, mae o'n rhywbeth sy'n Rhywbeth o'n i'n coelio yn enfawr yn y fo, a da ni eisiau bod yn hann o hwn y fo, a falch iawn o hwn y fo. Mae'n rhoi cyfleoedd i bobl sydd ddim yn cael cyfle yn y ddim yn cael y platform dylai fi ddweud gyrsel a pobl eraill. Um, a mae'n hefyd yn rhoi llais i ferched yn aml sydd yn lleol yn y gyrsel ag yn y hangach. So just to say quickly on behalf of Can, we are very proud to be a part of Willa Ferch and to be in collaboration with them for the third year running which is really exciting. Um, and it's something that's very close to um, something that we try and do and can anyways, is to give a platform, to give a voice to people that don't necessarily get the, the opportunity otherwise, as well as to um, give that platform to um, women, obviously, because we still don't get the same equality in some senses as we know. Um, so it's just very important to us to give that voice and that platform to people. And we're more than happy to help and mentor Fion and Esme as well on their journey in becoming fabulous ladies um, doing this sort of stuff in the, <laughs> locally as well as um, on an international basis, I suppose, as well, Fion. Um, if I could come, I'm just going to, I'm having problems with my mouth tonight again, ladies. Um, so I'm going to introduce you to Fion before I mumble and mutter more through this. Um, so do we mean to give a Fion to you know um, Trevenwyr? Um, a mae hi'n mynd i ddisbonio pyn bach mwy am dan gwyl y ferch, a lle mae'n cychwyn cyn i ni glywad gen rhai o'r artistiad. So before we go any further, I'm just going to introduce Fion, and Fion is going to um, tell us a bit more about gwyl y ferch and how it got started and where we're at now. So, Fion. Diach, Mena. Um, yeah, thank you all for coming. Um, it's uh, really good to have this programme of Artist Talks. Uh, and it's something that me, me and Asmi are learning so much about um, the practices of our exhibiting artists um, through doing this type of thing. So, Chydig bach o gefndir, mae gwyl y ferch yn fenter cymdeithasol, gafodd y gychwyn gynna fi a Esmi yn 2019. Dan ni erbyn hyn wedi cynnal chwech digwyddiad um, ac yn gweithio'r rhai am dair blynedd um, yn y digwyddiadau um, yn canoli, gael ei ganoli gan yn arddangosfa agored, yn oriol carn, um, ond digwyddiadau cyddoriaeth, um, ffilm, um, barddoniaeth, um, tiach o'n tiach hynny. So Gwyl y Ferch is a social venture started by me and Esme in 2019, and our, our events normally centre around an open exhibition in oriol carn, and we did one in oriol morn as well in 2019. Um, but offshoots of that, we do music events, film events, poetry events, um, and a poetry anthology every year as well. Um, so third year running, and um, we're really, really happy to be back at our home in Oriel Karen uh, again this year. Um, so I'm going to share a quick little video, um, just more information about us. This is like a little trailer thing. So I'll, I'll share my screen um, and we'll, sorry, bear with me. Where have I put this trailer is the question. Ah, quick time, there we are.
Pilates. Um, really happy uh, to be here for this artist talk. Um, and yeah, that's it from me. We'll hear from uh, from our artists. Yeah, Fionn. Uh, thank you, Fionn. So uh, I was saying to Fionn earlier, in that little tiny snippet, you get to have just a taste of what Will of Ed is about and all the work that they've done. And well done to Fionn and Esme because they've done brilliant stuff um, throughout the years. And uh, yeah, keeps on getting better in a way sort of thing. So die okay. Um, so anyway, without further ado, uh, we're going to introduce you to the artists and start hearing from them instead of just hearing me muttering on. Um, and if you do want to ask questions, please do so out loud after Mary Rose has finished talking, or ask, you can more welcome to put things in the comment or chat, the chat box as well. Um, so I'm going to stop messing up <laughs> what I'm trying to say and introduce you to Mary Rose Richard. Uh, Mary Rose. Well, dioch, mena. Uh, dioch, fion. A closer on this, Henna. Uh, very warm welcome, and it's very nice to see faces on screen, some familiar, some new, and uh, hopefully some yet to meet in life. I have exhibited in uh, the Festival of Guilaverch at Carn uh, for the second year uh, this year, and I submitted some drawings that I had been working on. Uh, drawing for me is a, a continuing practice that underlines most of everything that I do. And it, in a sense, it is very much part of my subconscious when it comes to understanding where I'm at with ideas, with the rhythm, of the work that I'm involved with. So at any point, I feel I have to return to some element of drawing. And the drawings which are hanging up in Karn at the moment are hanging face to face as though they are inviting you to uh, move either to one or the other. They have a feel of gravity about them and they have a complexity that makes you both stand back from them and get up close. I will share some images with you now and explain further what I mean. I'm going to start off with uh, Croth Radius 5. And to give you a sense of scale, I'm just going to quickly skip to the next image. So that's me working on the uh, Radius 5, the Croth Radius 5. And this one is Croth Radius 6, Radius Where. So if I can just go back to the first one. These drawings are a meter square. And I specifically chose to work within a square format as I knew I wanted to work within a circular motion. And it is this movement that, ten, that dictates really what happens next. And in, in the practice itself, I'm very much following the principles of uh, painting and how artwork develops where you lay a mark and you respond to that mark as a consequence and subsequently uh, include uh, marks over and over and over to create this uniform composition that has a harmony to it, that has a rhythm and also try to finalize what the overall concept is. So in some respect, I know what I want to achieve, but quite often the marks that I make, certainly in the early days, are perhaps not the ones that I had in mind, but they lead me to create the marks that follow through and certainly making sense of the balance between the light and the dark 
the intensity in areas, the lightness in others is very much part of that drawing uh, mechanism, drawing rhythm that uh, helps an image like this evolve. So the sister drawing to this, which is Radius Huer, is what I interpreted as it developed the inward looking drawing, whereas uh, Croth Pimp, the previous drawing, was the pushing outward. There were various comments over the few weeks where some of these drawings have popped up and I've met people in the gallery while they are talking in front of these drawings. Um, there's lots of connections as to what they can inspire somebody to read as to what they are. I gave them the title of Croth, which is Womb, because I felt that the energy that is part and parcel of that whole creativity, which is passed down through generations and generations, uh, is part and parcel of that evolution and the way the drawing evolves in itself. When we look at some of the detail that comes from the drawings, the onus was very much to work with both water-based graphite and graphite itself of various weights and intensities where the conversation is taking place between the surface of the paper and the quality of mark that the pencil or the graphite is making. As these developed, they had to be overworked overdrawn and intensified in sections. And I tried very hard to help this evolve slowly. So I would work on one drawing and then work on the other drawing as both had to lie down, so to speak. They had to sit back and wait for that next direction to come out really to talk to me to tell me what it is that they wanted and needed to keep this balance going. So one drawing does look more silvery and the effect of the graphite on, on the paper which is watercolour paper has that sheen to it which almost cancels out the drawing itself because the light touching the surface gives it a semi-reflection. The intensity of the marks I'm very pleased with. I have over the years worked on both primed canvas with graphite. I've worked on varying different papers to find out what I like, what I like to see happen. And invariably, every time I have been genuinely surprised as to how I just cannot dictate what is going to happen next. Some graphite skims and some doesn't. What the drawings did inspire and does, of course, uh, follow through are automatic drawings which really help me think they do help me relax even though the troublesome moments of you know you you've just created an area and it needs to be uh, sorted out so to speak understood and mirrored complemented or balanced in these drawings, I was using a, the same paper, the same watercolor paper, but certainly using many more different varieties of media. So I was introducing ink, I was introducing wax, and also uh, liquid acrylic. 
some of the things that I try to uh, illuminate in the workshop that uh, took place at Cairn last Monday and may yet happen again. So this uh, amalgam really of textures, of uh, scratches, dashes, really quite aggressive drawing marks in places are complemented by the washes and the, the easing down uh, in as much as I'm having a conversation with myself at the same time about all the things that are behind potentially all the marks that you see, not only in these drawings, but also when we go back to the cross radius drawings. How much thought is put into these drawings? How much of it is purely responding to the format of the paper or the rhythm of that first mark that tells me what to do with the next is a question which I'm thinking about constantly. I'm about to stop sharing. And in as much really without starting to draw and let you see how these drawings develop, um, perhaps this is a good time for me to pause. There is a lot more to say, obviously, but we may come to that. Thank you, Mary Rose. Um, yeah, another day it was fascinating. And the, especially, as I said the other night, um, when you were doing the drawing club, it was, yeah, it was really interesting to get to see what you were using and getting need to see how you got people to do the certain marks and how they, you got them to to work in your same way in a way or at least in the same manner that you that you tried to do these works with so it was quite interesting and to see their responses it was, mm. it was really interesting. they were all very different weren't they and what yeah what they achieved during those two two hours um, I do not know if anybody has any questions or comments that they'd like to do. Please say so now, or you can put something in the chat. Anybody else? You can just say things out loud if you want, anybody. Hi, Jen. <laughs> Hi. Um, can I ask, what, so when you're starting to do a drawing like this, do you have... Um, what is your go-to media? What would you start with? Do you start with a pencil or you've got a favourite um, graphite pencil or mm. something that you'd start it with? How do you start it? So uh, I know that personally I like to work with, uh, with all sorts of things. So in a sense, I've got my own, um, my own dictionary of things that I could start with. So I could either wet the paper first arbitrarily and then draw into it and see what happens to the marks as they just catch uh, drops of water or areas of dry paper. So that then tends to give me some feel of the sort of sweep that I want to create. Most of the things that evolve tend to have some link between the outer frames. So they either uh, cross and come out again, or they curve and sweep. So really as drawing, as drawing goes, it's just trying to feel that freedom on the page. So whether I start with water first or add water afterwards, or involve um, you know, water-soluble graphite. Uh, I like to use calligraphy ink because I find that it has a really lovely, rich density of black, really, which can contrast so well with any uh, wash patches or any light marks of pencil. I really do like to use the pencil to its extreme so that you know, it's capable of doing both 
the extremest light, extremest dark, and everything else in between. So I think it depends just on the moment as to what it is that I'm about to do first. And then consequently, there's an awful lot of, oh, okay, so we need to readdress this bit. So perhaps, you know, I need to take the surface of the paper off or I need to put the new piece of paper on, you know, in patches as though collaging the white spaces again. So it's, I see it, for me, I see it drawing as painting. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I think Julie wants to say something. I do, I have my yellow hand up. You, you have. have. Hi, Julie. Long thumb. Um, I was just curious, like in listening to you talk about the studio practice that you have of, of drawing, um, yeah, especially in this series of your work, a lot of it is, a lot of it is drawn out by the installation of it, like this epic size, this facing each other, is, is yeah. that, in this case, was that kind of part of your original intent with the series, or did you just get drawn into the creation of the work and then think about it afterward because they seem so closely tied in in this in this series i was just wondering how your thinking was as it developed while you were working on it so the two drawings happened simultaneously i i knew that i wanted to work with a circle i knew that i wanted to uh move from the outside in but the first one uh, off balanced me. The, um, if I can just go back to the drawings. So this one totally off balanced me. When I saw it the next day, I, I just couldn't really understand what had happened overnight a lot of things had disappeared a lot of things had sort of stuck hard and really it needed an awful lot of cajoling as to what should happen next and part and parcel with this drawing when i started this drawing then i wanted it to be a catalyst for the other drawing and I was a little bit wary that these drawings were potentially going to end up as a, as a zero, you know, totally wrecked, um, you know, and start again. When it came to the final stages, I think that's where they started to come to life. Um, because working with them together, side by side, I could understand what that push and pull. It was quite clear from the start that there was this inny and outy feeling. When it came to handing them in to Karen and asking Mena to hang them, there was this question uh, really as I had maximized on the scale of the uh, call. And I explained that I was happy with either one or none or, you know, and the option was potentially two. So when it came to two, I thought that really if they were hung face to face, uh, that would be that would be suiting the title of the of the story, really caught in between two uh potentials, you know, two wombs, if you like, you know, we're talking about two, um, you know, you're looking in and you're looking out, you know, I, I quite like that. I quite fancy, you know, yeah, a whole tunnel. Yeah. Things like that. Does that answer your question, Julie? Yeah. Yeah, thanks. It just seemed an important part of it, the, this part, and I wondered where, where and how that came, that came up. Thank you. Yeah, and you definitely get that feeling when you stood there between the both of them as well, because they are literally on both sides and you do feel engrossed in, in a way, don't you, in between two yeah. things that... Yeah. Sort of... 
Does anybody else have anything to say? Yes, somebody else. Car, you've got your, you've got your hand up. Hi, Car. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Loud and clear. It's lovely to see you. Really, lovely. Really lovely, lovely to see you too. The drawings. I was just wondering, um, you mentioned about uh, there was a, the number five and the number six, and one was cross, which you um, said woo. Yeah, the, no, they're both a, cross. Oh, they're both cross. You mentioned another Welsh word when you were talking. Radius. Radius. Rad oh, radius. Yeah, yeah. So they're both cross. Yes, the, these are cross. Yeah. And these were specific black and white drawings. Yeah. I had done a series before Christmas that were um, jelly plates, which were based on that circular motion um, from a, a compositional uh, discussion, really, as to how to make a circle um, compositionally intact. And they were they were prints. And I really like that feeling. So when it came to um, thinking about creating the drawings, mm -hmm. I wanted them to be circular again. So uh, the I suppose radius does give that feeling that it's, um, I kind of have this imagination that they're going round in, in time and that they're just con continually swooping round. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. I really, was really interested in what you were saying about um, the, the the idea of the creativity being passed uh, down the generations, and I, yes. I, I wondered um, if you could maybe say a bit more about that because that was really interesting. Yes, I mean, ex apart from the whole creation aspect of it. Um, I, I just, I always end up thinking, you know, who have I just passed, you know, maybe in the supermarket, you know, which is quite often where I'm, you know, just wandering around uh, without really bumping into anybody I know. So I don't know these people who I'm sharing a space with, and I don't know what they're capable of, you know, and there's so many women who create such beautiful things in the most minuscule or grandiose ways. And you just don't know. And I, I have a collection of underwear that my grandmother made. I have, because she had to make her own, I have uh, tablecloths that, you know, grandparents made. Um, my mum was very uh, talented when she was younger, but in the sense, most of that was put aside. Mm -hmm. So I do think, you know, there, is, there are gener generations of creativity being passed down the line, and I'm very lucky to be able to do what my heart's desire, really. Yeah, yeah I know that feeling. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> Thank You're you. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Kat. I think Fiona wants to say something as well. Did you, did you Fiona, or am I just imagining things? Yeah, I, I, did, I did, did do the little hand emoji. Um, yeah, it was a kind of more of a, more of a comment, really, um, than a question, because uh, I rem remember getting this piece into our inbox, um, and I looked at it for really long before reading your statement, trying to figure out how it was made. Um, and I thought it was a, a wood print of tree bark at first. And yes. then I was to look at all the detail and I couldn't believe that was all, all drawn. Um, and that similarly for last year, wouldn't have been last year, last event, 2020. Yeah. Um, when you had the light box, I remember yes. the same thing, kind of um, looking at it for ages, trying to figure out how exactly it was made. Mm. Um, so in both those pieces really... Um, what I what I really love about your process is you end up with something that's really difficult to even figure out how it was made, um, that it just sort of exists that way. Um, but yeah, it's not really a question, is it? But yeah, that's just a, a note about what what I find compelling about about what you make and about about your process. I think it's about giving Max, you know, um, uh, 
and that um, really these, you know, they're not whimsical in the in the least. The first, the piece on the the light box piece was very specifically about female gen genital mutilation, and. I was laying out newspaper this morning and found that there was an article from January where a woman had died from the, from the process. So all these moments keep coming back. And I think this layering, which is very much part and parcel of the, of the work that I think I create now that I have time to reflect on it, um, is, is there, you know, it's con continually accumulating but I do feel like I need to bring um, a lot of references into it. They're very sort of lab laborious as well. You know, the, you see yeah. the work in them, in the in the marks, like you said, not whimsical, not yeah. as I said, like visually light, that they, they, they look worked into. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, maybe I don't know. Is that um, uh, is that a working ethic? I don't know. Don't know. But um, I do enjoy it very much, and thank you for having me. Lovely. Unless anybody's got any more comments or questions, then we'll move on. And, and if anybody does think of anything else that they want to say or ask you, Mary, then they can do it after everyone else has spoken. Is that okay? Just so we brilliant. Can move. Um, so next up we have Rachel. Uh, so next I'm uh, Rachel Harris. So Rachel's piece is a textile piece that's hanging in one of the windows. Um, so I'm not going to say anything more. Let Rachel speak. And uh, yeah, I'll be doing some of the sharing for you, uh, Rachel. So just let me know what you want. More. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you. Hi, I'm Rachel. And um, I call myself a textile poet because I write poetry that informs the piece or sometimes a piece informs a poem that then will come from it. So the one that I'm very glad to be hanging in, um, in uh, the exhibition is um, called Bars of Freedom. And I don't know if you want to share, Mena, the um, actual piece itself, um, if you can do that. Um, that'd be great. But basically, um, it's a piece which has, and I, I really would like to pick up on Mary Rose's comment about layering. It has many layers to it because it, um, it looks quite um, lovely, as, as somebody once said, oh, that's a nice piece. And then when I started talking about it, it's not, it's quite a dark piece. So if I, if Mena, are you able to share that for me, the piece itself? That would be great. Thank you. Yeah, it's just a, it's a bit slow with the internet. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, um, so the piece started with, um, there we go, that's it. And the piece started with um, actually my dad's house in Manchester because he um, has bars on his windows at the bottom of the house. It's a three-story house and the bottom layer has bars on the windows and um and i and it was just playing on my mind the fact that you've got bars on windows to keep people out but it also gives you the freedom then to roam around inside your own space um that you've created um because you keep people out of the house that's what the bars are for and it allows you the freedom to feel free to wander around the house safe within that sort of um that that space and then I kind of looked at the fact that we do that a lot with our own souls we create the bars of our own freedoms that we can wander around inside our own heads or inside our own spaces where we feel comfortable we feel free to do that um, and um, um, and we create the space that we want to roam around in and then um, it kind of um sometimes you're forced to actually open the curtains if you like open the bars and um see the world beyond what is the space that you feel comfortable in that you feel happy roaming around in and sometimes that world's not very nice 
and and can be quite horrific um and so then you you know you sort of I don't know about anybody else but you close that curtain quickly and um want to stay within your own safe sort of secure space so you kind of only open it up when you you only go outdoors of that when you know that you can control that space that freedom that you have to keep yourself safe outside of that so um i i thought if i could just read the poem to you that it might give you some context to the actual piece um but um, so, um, and then I'll come back about how I made the piece as well. So, so the poem um, is actually, um, on the windows of our soul, we add our boughs of freedom to roam around behind, contented, keeping out the demons that threaten to betray our vision of reality, stepping out only when we are sure that our version extends to the pavements that we frequent. And so it, it's, so that's sort of this sort of two layers there is where it started and the sort of the soul and the freedom. And if you um, can see that, but actually how it was made. Um, and I love it because I love working with textiles because you can get quite a lot of it's, it's a very much a has been in the past and, and um, if, in moving forward, particularly quilting, very much a woman's sort of activity isn't it you um, working with cloth we um, creating things but then actually they can be very powerful images that can be portrayed within that sort of um quite um safe if you like women's type of work um so um the bars you um uh, th this piece actually came from and i don't know if you can share that um um manner the, the actual the other picture that I gave, it came from yep. just a bit of light relief. It came from um, doing an amazing um, day where the whole family were involved. We were at my sister's house in Ireland and we were um, just making, we were doing lots of dyeing and shibbery. Um, and um, and we just sort of did loads of dyeing, loads of shibbery and it all, all the pieces sort of, you know, where you get so really excited and using lots of different pieces of cloth and creating all these different images and, and you don't sort of, you then sort of, then I could see the bars and you can see them on the left hand side of that image there coming out. And that's when it started connecting um, and was able to be made, the piece sort of formed from that. Um, and um, and the next piece just sh shows the layering out of it. So that it did start off with more layers, more windows, more sort of bars going down through the sole but in the end for me it was just needed those two pieces the bars at the top and made into a window and then the extra little piece there as well um there so and the whole sort of thing sort of worked for me um the interesting side the other sort of layering underneath all of this so you create the bars of freedom which your soul is happy to wander around in um and you can feel safe in that but sometimes um people's doors and people's windows are actually hiding some very different types of um, unsafe, unhappy places. So um, domestic abuse in particular can be hidden behind doors and windows and the bars that are created there aren't necessarily um, bars that people can see. And they're not necessarily on the soul either, but obviously they're very deep rooted within sort of the household and within the actual um, soul itself too. So um, I kind of wanted to bring that up because obviously women's issues, particularly in the last um, in the last two years, have been domestic abuse has been very high. And I know it can be for men too. Don't get me wrong. I know that um, some of the DASU units are very much um, or domestic abuse units are very. You know, there are men want male ones as well. So I don't want to put that down. But obviously, it's a female sort of. Um, um uh, women's um exhibition so um i just wanted to bring that up as well as an issue because it's it's sort of all layered up within that um and there i'll leave it there if that's okay so thank you uh, thank you Rachel. um yeah it's really interesting to um hear about how it was pro how the process worked and how you made the piece because obviously i've seen the piece but haven't had that information from a guest. I haven't had the chance to talk to you at all through, throughout this process, really, about quick emails. Um, but yeah, good to hear that sort of background to it. And it's always interesting to find out how pieces are made, as we all think, sort of thing. So, anybody got any questions or say anything? Please do so. Or if you want to put anything in the chat. 
Yeah. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute. Yeah, <laughs> just going to say that. Do you want to stop sharing? <laughs> That's great. Thank you. That's fine. Oh, Jenny's got something to say. Hi. Um, yeah, I, really, I just want to ask you a similar question that I asked Mary, which is how do you start? But it, it strikes me it's a bit like um, I, when I was a young thing, I used to be a musician and write songs. And is it a bit like, you know, the tune and the lyrics or, you know, how do the two work together, the poetry and the, and the um, textiles? Yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, Jenny, carry on. No, that's, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, well, with, I, think, I think things mull around a lot before I start. Sometimes a piece can jump out and I'm working on that piece first. And it's like, um, and this, so for instance, I, I work with sea rope a lot as well. And sometimes that can actually, the rope can talk to me. I know that sounds silly but um but you know when you're talking you become, you form a narrative in your mind and the story comes from that but um so with this particular piece it was definitely that I could I'd been thinking about this bars of freedom I'd written the poem already it kind of was in my head um um and then uh, and the different layers were, were being worked through and then and then I made this shibbery and then suddenly I was so excited because I could see those bars and it just said yes that's what it's for and get a move on girl and get cracking with it you know and um and get your get your sewing machine out which is my 1957 grandma um nan sewing machine which I love it's a singer sewing machine and, and get quilting and that's what I did and, and and it's that sort of thing but sometimes it can it can be that you know you're working with sea rope or you're working with um a particular project in mind and and you know you want to, you know what you want to create and then the story will come from that or this the poem will come from that so it, it's very much together it's hard to answer that question completely but in this particular occasion the poem had come first and sort of it was being it was going around in my head and then that you know I was just had a fun day and then suddenly oh wow that's speaking to me get you know and it um it needed to be used <laughs> for that purpose wonderful <laughs> thank you <laughs> yeah Jane, Jenny, sorry. Uh, any other questions? Oh, there's a couple in the chat. Rachel, I'll read them up for you first. Oh, yeah. Um, um, Jane, Jane says, really lovely. And then Harriet said, powerful work, Rachel, and wonderful talk. Bravo. And then you. Renee said, uh, does your work usually have layers? And how, does those layers have any meaning? Yeah, I think. Um, yeah, I de they definitely have layers, lots of layers of meaning. And sometimes the layers will come out in the actual piece um, um, that I'm working on. But often, um, so, you know, if you're making a quilt or a quilted piece, you kind of, you know, it's there to be looked at as a piece, um, but it also has a lot of meaning behind it. So the other side of that, I don't know if you noticed, but when they were hanging up um, the two main pieces of of um uh of um dying were hanging up there was one side was obviously the piece that was going to form the bars of freedom but the other side was all these wonderful um sort of circles that had been created on another piece where i tied some um uh stones in around it um and that so yeah so the piece there and it almost looks like um jellyfish or um stars um shining and that piece actually much later on um when my friend's nine-year-old died um became a grief poem and a grief picture um a grief quilt um which so and that had many layers of meaning in it too so yeah I think my work does have layers and I think that's you know sort of listening to Mary Rose it suddenly struck me that has similar from that point of view the work can be it's not necessarily layers within the actual piece itself but layers within the thought process and the the poetry on the the piece and the meaning that all go together to create the end piece if you see what I mean it can't necessarily be seen within the piece I guess but the poem that goes with the piece and the uh, 
I'll stop there now. <laughs> Thank you. Does that make sense? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. Um. Yeah. Definitely the layers. Yes. Yeah, so there's that context between that bring um your work and Mary Rose's work uh to sort of join in a way or that there's sort of similarities that there are layers different meanings to use the word layers in that sense isn't there? Mm. Uh, okay does anybody else have any questions or comments for the time being or are we happy to move on okay we'll move on Rachel and then if, I would yeah. say if there's any more questions then please do ask them or make any comments Rachel Okay, so last but not least for tonight, because as I said, Wanda can't make it tonight, um, we've got Sarah Holyfield, and Sarah's got an installation piece, really, I think is the easiest way to say, isn't it, Sarah? Um, it's got some text piece, and it's been on printed on fabric, and then a sound piece to coincide with it. I'll let Sarah speak for that. Okay. Oh, thank you. I am going to attempt to share my screen. Um, right. um, is that okay for everybody? Yep. Yeah. yeah. Good. Um, really enjoyed those um, presentations. Thank you. And I, I realised my work sort of completely different. I think it's all, almost like a at the other end of the spectrum in a way, but um, I, and I'm going to talk to some notes if that's okay. Um, so what, what um, I wanted to, you know, the context that we're thinking that we're in, I suppose, is at the beginning of 2022 is that we're in a context of these huge kind of challenges and pandemic, huge inequality, ex poverty, this, this terrible invasion of Ukraine and small matter of looming climate change and everything. And I'm interested in how um, using technology and the beauty of natural materials that how I can help, how can help me to explore some of these themes. And also as a female artist, I suppose I'm also interested in using materials that may be more traditionally associated with women's work, perhaps like fabric and flowers and gold. Um, and I've been working on a series of works on the theme of a lament for the welfare state. Um, and one of these is in the exhibition, is my work that's in the exhibition. And I made it a while ago, but actually it's become topical again recently with all the cuts that have been happening, ha have been happening um, and the rise in the cost of living. I volunteer in a food bank and one day I looked at the process of claiming universal credit online and I was really shocked by what I found. Um, so there, there were these two pages of um, instructions on the government website, which loads of links and tasks that you had to do, and it could be downloaded in a print version. And when I did download it, it came to 17 pages, each of them did. Um, so I downloaded these onto two files, one in Welsh and one in English and printed them onto fabric, which produced strips that were 17 feet long. And there was something about printing something that seemed so kind of hard and harsh and unrelenting onto soft flowing fabric. So that's the picture of um, the installation of the work with, with one, set, one strip in Welsh and one strip in English. Um, a little close up to show some of the way the print comes out on the fabric. Um, and I also made a bilingual sound piece with two voices, with me reading with some a, a piece, it's about a minute long, me reading a piece of the text in English and my daughter reading the text in Welsh. And I overlapped them so the listener would find it very difficult to distinguish the meaning because of the confusing blur of voices. So it was a sort of attempt to convey how it feels to try and find your way through all this with the terminology and all the links to follow and do this and if you do this then do this and so on and then getting timed out so I was it was an attempt to try and convey that experience um I'd also um right I'd also oh I've got these in the wrong order now I'd also installed these um pieces in um in 
um, calfenicoid in Avon um, Ogwen in Bethesda, where the, uh, I've, my pictures have gone in the wrong order, so it'll probably show in a minute. Um, so my practices often involve combining materials and installations and collages and working with natural materials like flowers and, um, and tracing the changes that happen over time. So I've got a big collection now of dried and dead flowers, which I find very beautiful. And as part of this lament series, I was just gonna show you a couple of other bits of work in this series. Um, I made an installation in the form of a sort of altar. And um, I took those, the file, those two files um, of instructions um, and made a photo montage of those with dead flowers and displayed them above a table, which was covered in this white cloth and vases of dead flowers. Um, and I use and reuse some of these images and, and I make photo montages of flowers with food bank forms sometimes, the claim forms that one uses and photographs of share price index pages. And I've tried using which I was referring to of previously of the fabric between the trees. Um, and um, I've tried using different materials with these photo montages, um, sometimes using things like gold because of its meaning, both in terms of beauty and the fact it never tarnishes, but it represents wealth. And also using silk for some of the same reasons. Both materials have been used forever for trade and to signify wealth. So these images are mounted on gold leaf. And then I've used the same one to print on silk. That's a close up. Um, so these three pieces are um, the photo montages of different versions of these flowers. Um, and the, this work is obviously political and quite explicitly so, but, and I think it's the sort of thing I've grappled with for a long time about this question about tensions between being kind of polemical and campaigning and of just making art. Um, I want to express something and sometimes it's almost in the form of information and wanting to point at it. Um, so for example, here I made a piece uh, which relates to what people earn in a year. And I used, I made a grain of rice worth a thousand pounds. So you can see on the right, the bowl had four grains of rice and that was what um, you get for universal credit in a year. And on the left is 150 grains, which is what a banker would earn before bonus. And in between there's nurse and doctor and so on. Um, but in this installation, I also made two piles of boxes and the one on the left um, is um, a cubic, came, it, that comes to a sort of cubic meter of, um, rice, which is the equivalent of the earnings in one year for this CEO of Facebook. And the other um, larger one was 2.5 cubic meters of rice for the CEO of Amazon. Um, so that's a comparison of what people earn in a year. Um, and you'll see just in the background that my universal credit piece was there as well, the one I've, I've been showing. So I suppose I'm interested in how to visualize ideas, but also to try and do it in a way that's not just didactic, but has some kind of beauty or feeling or resonance as well. Um, so it's this whole kind of art and activism question, I suppose. And there are just so many amazing artists working so successfully in this way. Um, many of you have probably seen the walk, have you, with the puppet Little Amal? And I felt that this was a fantastic way of combining art in the form of theatre to produce a really powerful impact on a huge number of people because they walked this puppet all the way through Europe from Turkey to Manchester. Um, and Ai Weiwei also does this sort of work really successfully, loads and loads of people do. Um, and I've been making work also around the whole question of refuge and asylum. And I'm now wondering about whether to repeat the exercise which I did with the universal credit instructions on the sort of instructions for claiming asylum. And um, I, the printable version of this comes to 10 pages. Um, so I suppose that one of the things about this kind of work is that um, in a way, and it differs from other work, I suppose, in the sense that it's of its moment in a way. So perhaps it inevitably is a bit ephemeral, things move on, issues change and so, 
the work you make no longer is relevant perhaps and I suppose the question is does it matter um so those are some of the questions that I ask myself um so that's that's me done <laughs> um should I stop sharing yeah if you want to thank you Sarah that was really interesting and even though I I knew the background of it, it's still quite interesting to see where your work's progressing to and developing to and the next pages and stuff and I'm sure people have got questions and comments and stuff so anybody got any questions <laughs> any comments I've got, oh sorry okay <laughs> I'll wait for you Rachel Oh, OK. I was just going to ask. Um, uh, that's very powerful. And um, and I think the artist activist type movement is definitely um, getting stronger and stronger and huge um, and has been there. But also, you know, it's quite interesting. I, at the moment, I'm working on sort of conservation and research into eels and um, and a lot of that work is based on trying to make people sit up and think about climate change and all the problems but I've never it, it, that was really wonderful to see it displayed in such a powerful sort of way I think the ephemeralness of it let's hope it is ephemeral let's hope people can um you know sort of uh, it doesn't have to be used again I suspect that it probably will be though from um, many points of view especially the asylum one but so yeah no really amazing thank you Sarah, I thought it was absolutely fantastic. <laughs> I think I saw something of yours when I went to Karen, maybe to pick up a piece of my work or something. But I just love all the ideas. It's brilliant. Um, yeah, I think there was a piece hanging over a window. Was that in the members show? Oh, yeah. Or maybe, yeah. Oh, yeah, I would love it. And I want to know how you print onto the fabric. Because that's that's just so oh, it just creates such a brilliant effect, doesn't it? You know, to have all those forms actually printed out there, and then it kind of it, it's just an interesting idea. But yeah, well, it well it's um I'd like to say it's very mysterious, but actually <laughs> you can you could there's lots of people do it, so you can just send a file off to um, if you look up printing fabric. Um, digital printing you can just send files off and people will print on a whole variety of fabrics for you do you choose the fabrics though to go with the different themes that yes. you've got going yes so you buy the fabric or do you get to feel and see what they are before you order them or do they come as a surprise Oh no, what you can do, the places, I've, I've used a number of places and if anybody wants um, references, I can, t I, can, I can let you know, but people will send out samples so you can send off for us uh -huh. um, a pack and then you can just pick, you can go through and work out which one you want. There's lots of information online. They are. I'm, it's been such a discovery. It's been amazing. <laughs> yeah, it really works so brilliantly mm. with your ideas, but absolutely loved it all. Yeah, thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yes, Jane. I think Sean had something to say as well, did you, Sean? Yeah, really, it's just saying what everyone else has said. It's very, it's very powerful. And I think um, you're seeking that combination of, um, you know, the, the, the strong political voice with something that's, with art and activism, I think it's what you said, so that you're drawn into the um, the beauty of it in a way. Because I, I saw it in Oriel Morn, and I think I, I just went to look at the silk, and then you have a kind of shock when you realise what's actually printed on the silk um, and the grains of rice. And I think they make, I think they're even more powerful for that because of that. Um, um, element of art and interaction and um, I don't want to use the word beauty again uh, but you know because they're, ple they're pleasing in a strange way uh, but then that's that's what draws you in and then you get the, the power and I think I think that you're right that's an important impact and 
you know, I was just thinking of the asylum claim one because that was on the radio today about how people are trying to fill them in on their phones in a car. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, then they got to Lviv and the office was closed. They had to do it all again. You can only go to two centres, only open three hours a week. It's just appalling. So I think, um, yeah, you brought it right up to the minutes. Mm, thank you. Thank you. Because there is a thing, isn't there, about how, because you can, you can be kind of campaigning and say, oh, look, this is terrible. Um, and that doesn't necessarily, that's not necessarily um, art, if you know what I mean. And it's sort of wanting to somehow, there's something about wanting to make, like you say, to draw somebody in with something looking attractive to look at and then finding something else there. I, no, it doesn't have to be something horrible. <laughs> it's just that there's quite a few challenging things around at the moment, aren't there? And that's quite interesting on that point, though, is it, just before we go to Julie, because I know she's got a question. But um, there's the way that we've installed it and the way that you wanted it to be installed is that it's pinned on the sides, isn't it, in a specific place on the document yes. because it's got a really, well, slightly, it's basically disgusting and harrowing sort of well, it, it's got a it? bit, one of the sections quite near the end, it says, because it goes through, if you're this, if you're that, and all these sorts of things you have to do. And then it says, if you have a terminal illness, then do this. And then you read a bit. And then it says, if you've got less than six months to live, do this. If you've got more than six months to live, do that. Well, you can see from a practical point of view, perhaps they need to know the answers to those questions. But imagine having gone through all of that like you say, on your phone or a not very good connection, um, all of that, it's kind of, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. Really? Yeah, in case it just, it, just, it just struck me in the end when you were saying like, okay, all this information will change. So it's a very fleeting moment in, in it, but I think it's a powerful gesture to take this this document, which is internet based, which could change at any moment. And yes, there is some like action to archive the internet and all of these things, but I mean, who's gonna, who's gonna pay attention to that? I mean, who keeps that information and where? Um, but just as a small gesture of translating that entirely ephemeral document that severely affects millions of people's lives and making that a, a real thing that has length, because you never see length no. on the internet either. And just like the action of, of removing that from a digital space, putting it in, in a place. And it also just is a, is a kind of defense against that shifting baseline syndrome. When if someone comes across that in 10 years and says, and thinks that the problems they're having are new or thinks that something that society has come across is a new problem to be able to go back and be like, oh shit, like we've done that before. Like we haven't fixed anything or like just making history tangible in that, in that way for at least like the scope of that material, I think is really like powerful and kind of sets that document off on a, on a, different timeline than something on the internet might um that, that's really helpful thank you Julie. i hadn't thought about actually about the fact that it was i mean i had i'd thought about trying to pull the document out of the computer and see how big it was kind of thing but then to actually make it and then realize actually it is a sort of archive i hadn't thought of that and the other the other bit about the digital side of it is thinking about this printing is the only way I can print it on fabric is from a digital file that I have to send over the internet to someone who has a computer and will print it as a file onto their fabric. And then you end up with this beautiful silk. <laughs> kind of, the whole thing is full of contradictions. That's what I'm, I find intriguing about it. Yeah, and then the documentation of it is again a digital file. And most people will come across it as the documentation and you enter that loop of like yeah. two dimension, three dimension, zero dimension, real, digital, digital, real. And now we're talking about it all looking at each other in these little rectangles. Yeah. <laughs> I was just thinking, I was like, we're just digital, unfortunately. 
Yeah. But also, sorry, um, the fact that you're putting it on cloth, which yeah. is something that we have to we have to have. We have to clothe ourselves. We yeah. have to, it's been utilized all the way through generations and generations and generations. Bringing in Mary Rose's point about generations of art is, you know, we it, it's something which is so base a basic need that some of these people don't have even and to put it on and make it look beautiful and like the silk and um and 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 the cloth and then to actually like somebody said i i love the fact that you go up to a piece of cloth like that and you think wow and then you suddenly are confronted with that with Mm -hmm. that horror as well you know it's sort of that that was i think cloth textiles are such a powerful medium for that type of information yeah that's another contradiction in a way isn't it because the idea of universal credit and giving people is actually a, it, the idea is a kind one giving people enough to live on it's just yeah. what's happened there's something about the whole process that's gone <clears throat> horribly wrong yes and, and it's sort of become inhumane something that started off as a humane idea has become inhumane somehow I mean, I'm quite interested now in getting into stitching more, actually, which sort of feels like a kind of a bit like you've been doing, but this sort of that kind of moves it away as well from it's like that kind of collision of things. Very mindful stitching as well. <laughs> but I really, I really, um, I loved your drawings, Marie Rose. I thought, and it was funny because your drawings were right next to mine, and there was something strange. I can't explain it but I felt like they fitted well together the there was something about the way the fabric fell and it being black and white and there was something about it anyway I can't explain but um I think uh I I'm I'm a little bit uh overwhelmed by the amount of thinking that I'm doing and the amount of um linear paths that are being created tonight Mm. you know that can be extended and intertwined or they veer off and then come back that whole uh aspect of uh working with fabric with that specific instruction on it where it could easily be used to house you or clothe you, you know, even as temporary, uh, as, as temporary items. And then you're talking about stitching as well. Um, yeah, it's very, very powerful, just the whole imagery of it, uh, this sort of uh, uniting, you know, in the stitching but then in the same time you know as in filling in the forms to gain you're also losing a little bit of yourself Mm. as well in that every needle makes a hole in in the fabric so you are you know how much of it is giving you what you need and how much of it is taking away a little bit of who you are yeah. as, as well so and, and that's really what that whole process really brings to my mind is um those things that are out there to give you um are also taking a lot away from you as a as a person as a unit as a uh, important human i suppose it kind of raises the questions like we're today we're confronted aren't we with this whole thing about asylum and refugees uh, trying to get more visas and things but there's something about the idea that we can do something kind and humane we could do this in a kind way and what would that be like if you see what i mean it's yes i think it's difficult to uh, <clears throat> not to patronize isn't it mm. It's difficult not to point out the worst of of it all, really. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. There's some really good conversations happening. 
Yeah, and there's a, I think there's a lot of conversations where they could go on. <laughs> we yeah. could go on and yeah. tangents as as happen quite often in these talks, and it's great, and it's great to have the opportunity to be able to give you those opportunities to connect mm -hmm. and to possibly think of more ideas for the future and yeah help with developing it further and thinking of it in different ways as it did for you then Sarah. So unless anybody's got any more comments or questions and this could be for anyone now this could be regarding anybody's works or the exhibition overall or Gullivach or whatever um, I don't know if anybody has anything to say otherwise uh, in the meantime, I'll just say my little spiel for next week's talk, um, just in case any of you do want to think of something. Um, so, yeah, thank you to all the speakers that have spoken tonight. And for next week, we've got, um, I'm trying to think of who's got, so we've got Manon Parry, and we've got, um, I've forgotten who they are. My brain's not working, sorry guys. <laughs> Wanda Garner, who was meant to be tonight, but because she hasn't got a voice, she'll be next week. Um, and then we've also got, um, I've had a complete blank then. Um, I've had a complete blank, guys. And my computer's not, act, not acting as it should. No, no Williams, is it? Go on, Carl. I'll do that again. Uh, it, uh, uh, are you looking for the people for next week? Is, yeah, is, sorry, it was the no, moon, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I just had a complete blank then and my computer froze. Um, sorry, um, so yeah, so there'll be the three of them. Um, I'll just repeat those to be professional. Uh, Manon Parry, um, Wanda Garner, Simone Williams, and... Um, Renee says, and me. <laughs> and Renee, yeah, sorry. My brain, my computer froze, so it's freaking. Sorry, guys. Um, so yeah, and Renee. So, um, join us for that one next week at seven o'clock, and it'll be um on Zoom again, obviously. But um, in the meantime, as well, the exhibitions are open until the twentieth, and we are open, unfortunately, only three days a week at the moment: Thursdays, Fridays, and Saturdays. And um, yeah. We will be having a couple more events towards the end as well. I think it was an idea to have a poetry event on the 20th. But I'm still waiting for confirmation about some of that from the poets, but I think Fionn might have had some information about that, but I think she's not on, on here anymore. Anyhow, thank you. And thank you to uh, all three of you for talking and thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you for joining And you're thank okay. you so much. Yeah. And thank you for the chance to do this. It's really, I mean, it's a bit nerve wracking, but it's really great as well. Yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. It was really fun. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.